So first of all, you noticed uh, we have a guest priest with us this morning. Uh, this is Father Colin Jones. Uh, he is from the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis, up in Minnesota. Uh, he's an old friend of mine. We were actually in college seminary together. And now, whether you believe it or not, I know he doesn't look very old, but he actually works at a seminary now as a seminary formator. Right? Uh, so pretty crazy uh, for me to look back and realize that I really am getting older, you know? It's, uh, people in seminary formation. But anyway, so he, he works at the college seminary where we send most of our college seminarians. Uh, so he was here this weekend for diocesan ordinations. We had, thanks be to God, we had two men in the diocese who were ordained priests, right? And so he was the seminary representative, okay? So, so mind you, he works with a lot of our seminarians, okay? So, you know, the more that you talk up St. Bernard and how great it is, the more he's going to pass that on to the seminarians, right? And the sooner one of those guys is going to get ordained and replace me, okay? So have to deal with me for less time. Okay, so be sure to speak very highly of St. Bernard and about the community here. Also, you may notice at Mass this morning, there are also some guests with us from Wabash. Uh, so this weekend over at Wabash, this is the Big Bash weekend. And so we're actually hosting a breakfast for some of the Wabash alumni after Mass in the Holy Cross Hall. As you all know, there's a lot of really good things going on with our Wabash ministry these days. Uh, it's becoming very much a pride and joy of St. Bernard. We had over, a, we had 11 college students this past year who were teaching in youth ministry and religious education. So very awesome how uh, we're joining these two communities to better, uh, to, together. Right? So anyway, uh, today is the, the Feast of Holy Trinity. You guys know we've been going through different feasts of the liturgical calendar. We had the Feast of the Ascension, the Feast of Pentecost, and now we're in the Feast of Holy Trinity. And I thought about giving a long theological discourse this morning, but I thought that maybe we should continue our journey through the Bible, right, that we've been doing this whole year. We've been saying all year at St. Bernard, 2023 is the year of positive change. And one of the biggest positive changes we are making is that we are becoming more familiar with the Bible here at St. Bernard. We had our Bible studies during Lent, which had over 100 people in them, including a children's Bible study. And then during the Sunday homilies, right, we're going through the scriptures, right? So if you have your Bible with you this morning, we're going to continue on to Genesis chapter 24, and we're going to read about Isaac and Rebekah, okay? So remember a few, a few weeks back, we left off talking about Abraham. Remember we said that there were three promises that God made to Abraham? What were the three promises? He would make of him a great nation, of his descendants. He would make of his descendants a great kingdom, and that through his descendants, all the peoples of the earth would be blessed, okay? The three promises of Abraham. And if you remember, the big problem with Abraham was that he was his wife was barren. Right? What was his wife's name? Sarah or Sarai. All right, basically depending on which translation you're reading. Okay, and so they had a firstborn son, which he had with his uh, serv girl with his with his servant girl. What was her name? Hagar, and they had a son Ishmael. And then he had a second son, who was truly the son of the promise, whose name was Isaac. Okay. Now, I think a lot of times when we talk about the Bible, Abraham gets a lot of the publicity when we talk about the story of the Scriptures. But I think actually one of the unsung heroes of the Bible is actually his son Isaac. Isaac is an extremely important person in the Bible who is really a great example for us to learn a lot of different spiritual lessons. So, first of all, all of you are familiar with the most dramatic episode in Isaac's life, right? When Abraham tried to kill him, right? On Mount Moriah, right? What, why did God ask Abraham to offer up his son Isaac anyway? Why do you think God was trying to prove that? You don't, you don't need to say it out loud, but just think about that question. He was testing Abraham's faith. Right? God promised Abraham that through Isaac and his descendants... All the nations of the earth would be blessed. And so God was testing Abraham whether he really trusted, whether he really believed. In fact, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, it says that Abraham actually believed that God was going to raise Isaac from the dead. That was the faith that Abraham had. But see, the really, the really amazing thing about Isaac, and some of you might remember this because I've talked about this before, is that when we think about the story of Abraham and Isaac, we tend to think of it all about Abraham, right, and his faith and his trust. And we think of Isaac as just like the naive, ignorant little kid going along with the plan, right? In many children's Bibles and stories, right, it always depicts Isaac as a little kid. Man, 
that, that baby is really into this homily, isn't it? Man, that is awesome. Don't you love it when you hear babies at Mass? It's like such a sign that our parish is growing. I love it. But anyway, so a lot of us think that Abraham is the hero of the story, but it's actually Isaac. If you read the, the genealogy and the chronology of the book of Genesis carefully, it's clear that Isaac was not a little boy. He was already a grown adult. He was probably in his mid-30s when this happened. That's why he, and not Abraham, was the one who carried the wood all the way up the mountain. It's not an easy task. So he was already a grown man at the time of the sacrifice. Completely changes the story, right? It wasn't just that Abraham had faith. It was that Isaac was obedient and trusting in God's promise. And he willingly submitted himself to be slain on the altar. And thanks be to God, right, it ended up not happening. But that's one of the first things we learn about Isaac, is that he was a man who trusted in God's promises. He was a man who trusted in God's plan. And there's, a, there's an old Latin word that I, I think is really meaningful in this regard. How many of you have ever heard of the word gravitas? Gravitas, okay? Gravitas means like you have a great seriousness to most things. Right? Now, the opposite of gravitas, any Latin scholars know what the opposite of gravitas is? Father Jones, you took some Latin in seminary. Do you know what the opposite of gravitas is? Levitas? I think I, think I heard him say it, right? Levitas, okay? It's the opposite of gravitas. So levitas means that like you have a, a certain lightness to you and your approach to light. Somebody who has levitas is somebody who does not get filled with anxiety about the different concerns of light. A person of levitas is somebody who doesn't get easily irritated or frustrated when things are not as they should be or don't go their way. A person of levitas is somebody who trusts in God. And therefore, they don't let the different anxieties and concerns of life weigh them down. Levitas. I think that levitas is one of the virtues we are in great need of in modern Christianity, in modern Catholicism, especially as the culture gets more and more secular, more confrontational against Christian values. It is important for us to practice Levitas. To not become angry and embittered, overly anxious. To still be trusting in God's plan and that He is working in our culture and in your life. You know, a, a great example of, of Levitas, there's a, there's a priest over in Greencastle. And so Greencastle is, uh, what's that, like 40 minutes from here or something like that, right? Uh, Greencastle, there's a priest there named Father John Hollowell. Right? How many of you have heard of Father Hollowell's story? Right? Some of you may be familiar with him. Uh, Father Hollowell, he's kind of well-known in the United States because he's one of the priests out there that does YouTube videos, right, and different commentaries and stuff. And so he's got kind of a following on the Internet. And about four years ago, Father Hollowell, he's in his, he's in his late 30s, right? He's a very young priest. He was diagnosed with a brain tumor in his late 30s. And Father Hollowell, I've been, I've been able to meet him a few times, and when he was diagnosed with, brain, with a brain tumor, right, he didn't spend all of his time questioning God, right? Why did you let this happen to me? I'm young, I'm in my youth, I'm a priest, I've done everything you asked me to do. Instead, what Father Hollowell did is he took it as a sign from God that God was calling him to offer up the sacrifice for some of the people most in need. This was right at around the time, a few years back, when some of the, the church scandals were really coming to the fore again. And he decided that all of his suffering, all of his treatments and everything else from his brain tumor, he was going to offer up for all victims of church sex abuse. And again, instead of looking at it and saying, why did you let this happen to me, God? He took it as an opportunity to do something for others. 
He saw it as a sign of God of his way of offering up his pain and his suffering. Levitas. See, one of, one of the crucial things about Levitas is that you first have to trust God and you have to be obedient. Father Hollowell didn't stop praying. He didn't stop living his priesthood when all this stuff happened. He stayed the course. One of the reasons why so many of us don't have levitas in our lives, why we get so anxious about so many different things, is because our first priority is not first following God. Being obedient first and foremost. Surrendering to God. And once we surrender to God, He does take care of us in different ways. Maybe not in the ways that we expect it, right? Father Hollowell didn't know if he was going to survive this brain tumor. Now, thanks be to God, amazingly enough, uh, some of you probably heard this, uh, a few months ago he was actually able to go to Lourdes, France, which is where Mary appeared in the 1800s, and he actually has been miraculously cured of his brain tumor. So if you ever get a chance to go to, over to Greencastle, and he's actually going to get moved to southern Indiana, but make a point to go over and meet him. He's a, literally a living miracle. His brain tumor was cured. But first he had to suffer. And levitas doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that God is going to heal you of all your illnesses. It doesn't mean he's going to resolve all the issues in your life. Levitas simply means that you believe that no matter what happens to you, God has something in store for you. you know, another example I can think of is there's a, I met a man a, a few months ago who actually works for our diocese, so he's working for the church, and uh, he lives in Westfield, Indiana, right? So a very well-to-do area. Right? And uh, he was the breadwinner for his family, was making triple figures, and he was working in for hospitals. He was selling hospital equipment. And his company that he was working for, right, making all this money, they developed this invention that was able to uh, be able to basically diagnose any sort of illnesses that infants had when they were already in the womb. And it was a very easy way for them to identify this just by means of like testing the people's bloodstream and stuff like that. And to this person who I was talking to, and he's a, he's a devout Catholic, having a great job, and he realized that eventually people were going to start to use this invention to decide whether or not they wanted to keep their infant or not. Unfortunately, in our modern culture, the culture of death, many people are told that their infants' lives are not worth living. And so they're encouraged to have an abortion and other things. And this man realized that that was going to happen in his company eventually, whether or not he supported it. And so out of obedience to God, he took a leap of faith and quit his job. And he told his boss exactly why. Now he works for the diocese. And trust me, he doesn't make a whole lot of money. When you work for the church, you don't make very much money. But it was amazing when he was telling me the story, and he was talking about how much more spiritual depth he has in his family now. Because he said yes to God. Sure, it would be nice if he still had a triple figures job. But he feels the blessing that God is pouring out upon his life. Because he was obedient. Because he trusted God first. You know, one of the most amazing things about the story of Isaac, and if you have your Bible, I want, I want you to read with me. It's Genesis chapter 24. It's verse 62 and following. This is the story about Isaac and his wife. Anybody remember what Isaac's wife's name was? Nope, that's Abraham. Rebecca. Isaac and Rebecca. Full of Bible trivia today. Right? Genesis 24, verse 62. This is what it says. Now Isaac had come from Beer Laha Roy and was dwelling in the Negev. And Isaac went out to pray in the field in the evening. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted her eyes. And when she saw Isaac, she alighted from the camel and said to the servant, Who is the man yonder walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. 
And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into the tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Why did I choose to read this passage? This is a story about Isaac meeting his wife for the first time. Met his wife, Rebecca. And the story says in Genesis that literally the first time he met her, he took her into his tent and she became his wife. Pretty crazy, right? You parents, if, you, if your children told you that's how they met their, their girlfriend or their wife, right? What would you have to say about that? Probably wouldn't like it very much, right? But what was happening in this story? You know, the background of the story is that Isaac was living in a foreign land surrounded by pagans. And so his father Abraham knew that if he married one of those pagans, most likely they wouldn't share the same beliefs. And they would be tempted to take him away from his trust and belief in God. So Abraham sent his servant hundreds of miles away to go and find one of his relatives, and that she would become his wife. Now again, all, all, all you young men in here, right? Okay, If your parents told you, we're going to go and we're going to find you a wife, right? how would you feel about that? Probably not very good. I'm not advocating for this, okay? Not, not advocating for arranged marriages or anything like that. But what I'm saying is there's a beautiful truth that happens in this story. Isaac trusted that God was going to reveal his plan. That the servant was going to ask for a sign from God. And that sign would make it clear who was to be this woman who would be a blessing to Isaac. And this woman, Rebekah, had the faith in God to see the signs that God had prepared. And she left her family. And she traveled hundreds of miles to go and be wed to this man who she had never met, but only had heard that he was a man of profound holiness, a man who God had blessed. And she trusted. Again, I'm not advocating for people to date like this or anything like that. But what I am saying is how often in our walk with God do we want to be the ones in control? We want to be the ones creating the plan. But part of Levitas is that you trust that God is going to reveal His plan for you. And you need to be awake. You need to be watching. Listening. Every single one of us in our daily prayer, that should be the first thing we pray about. God, where are you leading me? What are the blessings that you want to give me? Not the blessings that I want to demand from you. When we take that approach to life, it's amazing the kinds of blessings that God can pour upon you that you never anticipated. I told you guys last week about you know when I became a priest, right? how I never wanted to be a priest. I never wanted to go to the seminary. But I can't imagine doing anything else. So many blessings that I never expected. Because I said yes. And I trusted that God had something in store for me. What are the things that you are clinging to? That you're demanding from God? I pray that all of us might be inspired by this example of Isaac. Rebecca, to let God be the one who leads you, and that we would be humble enough to listen and pay attention. What are the signs? What are the people? What's the direction he's trying to lead you in? And we might all say, yes.